Good morning, church. You guys hear me? Yeah? Cool? Good okay. Good morning. Uh, you guys can talk. It's okay. I promise I do not bite. Um, so, I'm actually really excited to be speaking today. So, before I say anything, uh, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time in your word. Um, first and foremost, we just are appreciative of the opportunity to be seated in your presence, dear God. And I pray this morning as your word goes forth that may you open our hearts, open the eyes of our understanding. And I pray that as we feast from your word, may we find it delightful to our taste, dear God. And may we not be hearers of the word alone, but doers as well. May it show fruit and be evident in our lives. Thank you, Father, for answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're going to go into the book of Ephesians today, chapter 2. Um, but before I do that, I want to talk about why I'm going to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Um, so yesterday, as Pastor Jimmy said, we were at the blog party. And it was cool. Like, it was like a lot of like people from different cultures and things like that. And obviously, you know, Roots, we were there. And um, while we were at the blog party, there was one rapper that was like rapping on the... Because uh, they, like, um, um, they had like some gospel rappers and they had like some other rappers and things like that. So there was um, one of the other rappers that were there. He was, he was rapping, and as he's rapping, this guy comes up to me, this guy from the block party. He walks up to me, and he's like, yo, man, that dude's cool. And I was like, yeah, he is, he, he is pretty cool. And he was like, uh, I think I'm going to make him an offer. And I was like, oh, okay, are you like a producer? And he was like, no, no, no. And I was like, oh, okay, well, like, do you do music? And he was like, no. He was like, uh, I'm a drug dealer. I was gonna, I'm going to make him an offer, a business proposition. And I was like, oh, OK, cool. Uh, because I didn't want to seem super startled. But um, I caught myself. I caught myself. I caught myself in, in the way that I was startled. I knew that there was a certain, like not only was I surprised, I knew that I lacked a certain amount of sympathy or empathy for that brother. And it was a heart check because I don't know how many of you guys know my story. I was a drug dealer. And so for me to have a conversation with a current drug dealer and, and for me to almost be, for me to be judgmental, it was just like, Zoo, we, we have to take a step back and remember like when you were saved, why you were saved. And salvation had nothing to do with me. And we're gonna go into Ephesians to talk about like there was nothing that we could do to be saved. Therefore, when we, when we come across unbelievers, the amount of sympathy and empathy that we should have toward them in their sin should be way greater because they are literally just like us. Okay, so that's why we're going into Ephesians chapter 2. So with that being said, we can open to Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm going to start from verse 1. And Fahim, you can just tell me when I'm like, time, because I'm, I'm only going to do like the first eight or nine verses, but yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, um, verse 1. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping ahead, sorry. Verse one, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, really quickly, it's, it's interesting here like that Paul is letting us know that although we were dead in trespasses and sins, we still walked according to as he says, according to the course of this world. So it's like, I'm just like, okay, well, Paul, if we're dead, how are we walking? I don't really get what it is that you're trying to say. But I believe Paul is alluding to that, like, we were so dead in our trespasses, so dead in our sins, that, like, that's where our life was. So before you were saved, like, you found the most exciting times, the most exuberant times, the, mo the most delightful times doing things that were sinful. So, like, like when you were having the time of your life, it was in those trespasses, in those sins, which Paul refers to as this dead that we were in. And walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. And, by, and we were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Now this is the part that kind of scared me because it says that in verse 3, among whom, we all, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. And that among whom also we conducted ourselves, it's likening like the manner of our conduct 
to the power of the air that it was talking about in the verse before. And I didn't realize how, just how dark deadness was before that time. Like, so when you're like living in sin, enjoying your life of sin, like that's a really dark time. And the Bible is likening that time in the same accordance, in the same likeness, in the same manner of the prince of the power of the air that worked in that time. So really just Satan and the devil. And really just being after everything the flesh is after in the same way the Satan is after us being, every, being in everything after the flesh is after. And the part that scared me the most, he says, and we were by nature children of wrath. Now, what can a dog do to change its nature? Like if a dog is like, hey, uh, I don't want to be a dog anymore. I want to be a cat. There's nothing a dog can do to change its nature. It's inherent that way. And we, by our nature, were children of wrath. And I'm just like, there was nothing we could do to change that about ourselves. And that right there opens, opens at least my heart to check my sympathy when it comes to unbelievers. That in the same way that there was nothing I could do to save myself, they're in the same boat. And there's nothing they could, because it's almost like we have this mindset when we talk to unbelievers, we're just like, just do better. Just try harder. Just be a better person so you can be a Christian like me. And that's just not the way it works. Like, not at all. And to know that we were by nature children of, and Paul says we were by nature children of wrath just as the others. It, we're, he's putting us in the same boat, and then he starts off verse 4, like, but God. So like we are in the same boat with the children of wrath and, and we, we sin the same, we enjoy these sins the same, we both are helpless in our helplessness, but God, I love that part, those two words is my favorite part of the whole thing, but it says, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love. Now it says that God is rich in mercy because of his great love. Now the question that I ask is like, what is there to love? Because when it comes to us who are dead, right, in our trespasses, dead in our sins, it's like, what is there to love about someone who loves doing everything that you hate? Because the Bible makes it explicitly clear that God hates sin. So it's like, and while we are in our sins, we love doing the things that God hates to do, which is our sinful behavior. So it's like when, God, when the Bible says that God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, I think like, God, what is there to love when you, look, when you looked at me? Because I loved doing everything that you hated, and I had no desire to be saved. Neither did any of us. I, I, like the desire to be saved comes from Christ. And I think that it's remarkable to see the power in the love of God. That the power in the love of God is remarkable so much so that he looked at you while you were loving to do everything that he hates and still decided to love you. Oh, God is good. Um, and he says in verse 5, even when we were dead in trespasses made us alive. And that, and that when is really key because that provides context for when Christ decided to save you. And at least for me, I don't know about you guys, it's hard for me to think that Christ died for me when I was like bad. It's like, you know, Christ knew, Christ saw me guilty and then he knew that I was trying to make the right steps toward the right direction and then he decided that's when he was going to save me. And that's just not true. Like it's so much easier to think that Christ decided to save me when I was on the path to becoming a good person. And that's just, that, that's just not, that's not Bible. And it's just like, no, why? It says, the Bible says when, when we were dead. Now remember that, that dead is a walking dead person loving the dead they're walking in. That's the when that the Bible is talking about. Like that's when he made us alive together with Christ. And that even made us alive together with Christ. If you guys haven't noticed, like I'm really big on phrases. Um, I just think the Bible is where, and Paul words things so specifically, so I don't want to miss those things. It says, when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ, raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places. And so this is how I give myself an illustration for that to understand what that means. Because what does it mean you made me alive together with Christ? We weren't born at the same time. What did it mean that you raised us up together when he, on Sunday, Easter Sunday, I was still 
in heaven or wherever I was before I was here. So what do you, help me understand what that togetherness means. And so this is the illustration that I came up with for myself and I hope that it helps. So when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Now I don't know about you guys, but there's, it's really difficult, like it's really hard, well it was really hard for me to believe that Christ actually died and was dead. Like that's a weird thing to, because obviously you know like he, he died and then he rose. And it's like we like we skip over and like we say the die part so fast, like because it's kind of just like he died. Like that's it's weird for us to think that Christ died and was dead. And it's like if Christ didn't die, the gospel doesn't work. And it's just like Christ, he died. And so think of this is the illustration. So Christ obviously on the cross carrying the sins of the world, right? This is the state in which he died. The same way we, in our life before Christ, carrying all of our sins, loving it, headed towards death anyway. So in, in that same likeness, like it was in that same likeness that, Christ, that God, as it says, in, it was in that same likeness, sorry, that God made us alive together. So Sunday morning when Jesus' eyes shoot open and, and, and God makes Christ alive, it's in that same way, in that same togetherness that God makes us alive in Christ. That's right, Malachi. See, Malachi understands what I'm saying. <laughs> now, he says, he, he raised us up together and he made us sit together in, he, sorry, he made us alive together and he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, when the Bible says he made us alive together, raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places, these are all past tense phrases. It, wasn't, it didn't say that he will make us alive together or he will raise us up together. It says he made us alive, he raised us up together, and he made us sit together in the heavenly places. And Paul, first of all, two things. Paul is using the word us, likening us to Christ, the same thing happening to Christ that happens to us. And secondly, he's using past tense phrases, and it's like, what do you mean he raised me up with Christ? Because I didn't die. So it's like, how, how, how was I resurrected? And the Bible is making it clear that salvation, like that salvation is that coming to life. And, and, and obviously the phrase born again lets us know that there is a new birth that occurs. And I want to point out that the way that Paul is speaking in regards to this past tense, Jesus Christ does the same thing. So turn with me really quickly to John chapter 5. Because Paul is speaking in past tense, made us alive together, raised ED us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places. And so in John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus says, most assuredly, so I'm not lying, or really truly, or listen up, or however you want to coin most assuredly to you. He says, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed, ED, has passed from death to life. So the same way that Christ talks about our, our secured eternal victory in him is the same way that Paul talks about it. And that, uncomfort and that past tense should make you uncomfortable. That, as Jesus Christ says, you've already passed from death to life. So while you were in your sins, while you were in the world and loving it, that's the deadness that we were in. Our salvation, us looking at sin differently, us not desiring sin, that's the life that we have passed into. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay, cool. Okay. Now, next page. So we can go back to Ephesians now. Um, back to Ephesians chapter 2. And we are at verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might, show, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So Paul is foreshadowing now like that in the ages to come that God might show the exceeding, rich, exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. I believe that if God wanted to, because he's God, he could show his grace in any way that he wanted to. He could show his grace in so many different ways. He could make up ways to show his grace, but he chooses to show his grace 
in his kindness toward us. And he just didn't have to do that. And there's a, there's a different, hopefully this message brings a different layer of gratitude, if you will, for God's grace and for unbelievers. That, that's the point of it. Because God, God has decided to show the riches, the, the surplus of his grace by his kindness towards us. That's how he decides to show it. And so, uh, so that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Now this is the part that like, I want us all Christians to hear this and to believe this. For by grace you have been saved. And I know that this is one of the phrases that we quote the most often. But I don't know if it's because our flesh is bent on pride that we think that some, somehow, you know, I, I earned the salvation that I walk in. Or like I've been, I've been walking with the Lord for five years and I think that because I've been walking with him for so long that I've reached a point in my walk that I've earned the fact that I'm saved. And that never happens. So when you, when you, when you take yourself and when you take someone who is, you know, on the streets, in drugs, fornicating, whatever, whatever sin that you want to call it, like when you take yourself, when you take that person, you guys, is like both dead. Both dead. Both equally dead. But God, in his grace and but God in his mercy, decided to call you out of that darkness into his marvelous light. Like that's, it's awesome. I heard an illustration, this was actually a really good illustration of what, what the call of salvation is like. So let's say for example, I'm just going to use Pastor Jimmy as an example, because he's the person I can pick on. Let's say Pastor Jimmy is sleeping, right? Pastor Jimmy's sleeping, I don't know, maybe he has had, he's had a long day with Malachi, and he's sleeping. And I go up to him and I'm like, Jimmy, Jimmy in his sleep doesn't decide in sleep, hmm, I'm sleeping, do I want to wake up? He doesn't decide that. The, the nature of sleep and the nature of the call, me yelling Jimmy's name wakes him up automatically. In that same way as we were all dead in our sins and God said, Cheyenne or Alec or any, Hannah, like the, the, he, he called our name in such a way that we had no, oh, we, we just woke up. It, it, was, it was literally that simple. You didn't decide, hmm. Well, I'm saying I've got about five and a half hours. I'm in my REM sleep cycle. Do I want to wake? That's not the way it works. God calls you and you wake up. So when it's like when he's like Lazarus, boom, Lazarus' eyes is open. Come, come forth, and he's gone. And, and that's the nature of salvation. And there was nothing you could do. Jesus Christ says in the book of John. I didn't write it down. Oh, I wish I wrote it down, so I could tell you where it was. Um, if you have Google, you guys can Google it later. But Jesus Christ said that. And his sheep are in his hand. And, and he's not losing any of them. None of them will be lost. All of his sheep know his voice and they all respond. They all, like he calls them all and they all follow. In that same likeness, like when God calls your name in your deadness, you follow in that same path. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those who he called, he justified. This is all past tense. Those who he justified, he glorified. It's done. And there was nothing you had to do other than believe. And all of the people that God has called us to, Christ has done it for all of them too. They're just, oh, and uh, he's done it for all, of, he, he's died for all of them. He's paid for all of their sins. All of their sins are done away with on the cross. And, and, and it's our job to preach, hey, this is what's been done for you. And it's impossible to do that effectively without Sympathy, knowing that in the same way that it was done for them, it was done for you. And you guys are the exact same. I think that a lot of outreach is unsuccessful because of lack of that understanding. That we have so many Christians going out into so many communities and they're feeding people and they're doing this and that and the third with the heart that we're better than you and we're reaching down from our ladder of salvation to help you up. And no one is saved because even if, like, even though we're feeding and even though we're giving, the, 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 the heart of it, the root of it is in the wrong place. So I pray that God really works through this word to change how we see people who are not saved. 
It says verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It was, it is, sorry, the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. And verse 10, the last verse, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now we're God's workmanship. We, we, we were created in Christ for good works. We were created in Christ for good works. Good works being the gospel. Good works being reaching out. Good, good works being evan evangelism. These, these are the good works that we were created for in Christ. And that's why our nature, the very fact that we are created in Christ lets us know that our nature has changed. The nature that you were created in is the nature that you have. As we, were, as we saw in verse 4, we were by nature children of wrath. Now that we're created in Christ, we have a new nature, a new inheritance, a new identity, a new inheritance with Christ. We were created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in, that we should walk in them. And earlier, as we talked about, us being dead and walking in the way of iniquity and walking in that deadness. Now the Bible is saying that because we're created in Christ and we have a new nature, we are now walking in the good works that God has prepared for us beforehand. So today's, that, that was it. <laughs> so today's message was to remind us, today's message was to remind us who were, okay, I, there's a typo here. Today's message was to remind, I have no idea what I wrote, wow. Um, hmm, let me try and figure it out, give me two seconds. Today's message was to remind you. Oh, got you. Today's message was to remind you who you were. So, okay, I see what I, okay. Today's message was to remind you of who you were and who you would still be if not for Christ. That's what today's message is. So today, now that I got the sentence, I can look up and say it. So today's message was to remind you of who you were and of who you would still be if not for Christ. That's the point of today's message. I hope that it will bring sympathy in your heart for every non-believer that exists, that it, will, that it will inspire your prayer life in such a way that you make intercessions for people in this community, in this city, and all around the world. And lastly, that you worship God, because we, we're going to go into worship after this. Um, and so lastly, that you worship God with a heart full of gratitude, killing every ounce of entitlement to salvation that you may feel, embracing fully his grace and your dependence on it. That's, that's the point of this message. Um, and here at Roots, we do the majority of our worship at the back end of the service after the message. And we ask ourselves two things. One, what did God say in his word today? And two, what's my response to it? What am I, what am I doing about that thing? So this morning I believe we learned what salvation is and how it happened. And because of how it happened, how we should look at others, how we should fix our heart toward others, and how we should be super grateful and gracious for what Christ has done in us. So that's the point of today's message. So as we worship and as we go into worship and prayer here, um, just take, take your moment. Take your time. Reflect whether that's talking to God, whether that's repenting of your own self-righteousness, whatever that, that may be, whether that's, you, you know yourself, all right? I don't, I don't know you. Um, so just go before God and do that. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for, first of all, for your word, for how powerful your word is and how alive your word is in us. I pray, dear God, that as your word has come forth this morning, that it convicts our hearts, dear God. I pray that you help us to search our hearts in this time of worship for any self-righteousness. I pray that you, if there's any way that we are just if there's any way that we think that we have earned salvation, or if there's any way that we think that we have earned this right to be yours, I pray that you just remove that understanding. I pray that you fix us in such a way in a position where we 
are just really, really grateful for what it is that you've done. Filling, heart bursting with grace for what you've done. And in the same way that you called Lazarus for it, that that's how you called us for it. So I pray that that good work that you've done in us, that may we be really appreciative of it today and aspire and dedicate the rest of our lives, as the Great Commission says, to do that work in other people. In Jesus' name, amen.